Great. Okay. This evening, why is this just giving me the hardest time tonight? We are going to be talking about PFAS and persistent contaminants in our lakes. Um, we are going to be joined by Jonathan Patelli. I hope that's I'm saying that right. He's the toxicologist from the Environmental Health Program at New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And for this meeting, we are recording. Um, so anything you can, um, anything you do say during the meeting will be recorded. We're going to have this up on our YouTube page just to ask that you keep your cameras off um, just to help keep background um, visuals and audio at a minimum. During the webinar, you can chat, use the chat box to ask questions just in the bottom of, or the top of your screen. If you're not familiar with Zoom by now, there is a chat feature. Um, you can type that in there, everybody can see it. If people wanna chime in or have um, something to add, they certainly can. If we're able to find the answer, we will. Otherwise, we will wait until the end and have our expert this evening answer those questions and you will receive an evaluation form, please do give us your feedback. It helps us make sure that we are doing our webinars to the best of our ability. It's also a good opportunity for you to let us know what you wanna hear next. And um, we have several webinars um, on the book so far, but we are always looking for new um, and exciting things that people are interested in hearing about. So do please fill out that evaluation form. Just a quick little backstory. I think um, we have a lot of repeat um, attendees, but we'll go through this quickly. Um, New Hampshire Lakes is the only publicly supported nonprofit um, working for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes, and you can support us today at NewHampshireLakes.org. And we're working to keep our lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. We work with partners to promote clean water policies and responsible use and inspire the public to care for our lakes. And we do that through our three programs. We have an advocacy program helping give all of our lakes a voice at the state house, our conservation program, which is um, very busy at the moment with our lake host program this summer, making sure that boats aren't carrying aquatic invasive species and our lake smart program, um, which you can do right from the comfort of your own home by starting with a lake smart survey it takes about 15 minutes to fill out some questions about um, common everyday things around your house. And then you'll get a personalized detailed PDF with some recommendations on what you can do um, to help the health of our lakes. And then our outreach program, which is bringing you our webinar series this evening. We're your host this evening. Um, I'm Erin Mastine, the outreach coordinator, and Kat Kelleher is the conservation program assistant and our expert this evening. And at that, I will stop sharing. And Jonathan, you can go ahead and get started. Perfect. Thank you. Let me get, make sure I share this correctly. Okay. Um, presentation up? Yes, it looks great. Okay, great. So, hi, I'm Dr. Jonathan Batali. I'm a toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, a little background about me. I actually have my PhD in environmental toxicology and occupational health from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I also have engineering and I'm an avid person. So that's a little background about me. Uh, I'm from the Midwest originally. So when I get about time, Jonathan, Internet you do connect. seem to be freezing, unfortunately. Okay, hold on just one second. What I'm gonna do is just one second. And I'm gonna call in.
Hmm. For some reason, it's not. I, I just asked your phone to unmute. You should be able to select the number to do it. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks, Kat. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, terrific. Sorry about that, everyone. I have sometimes a wonky internet connection. So I'm going to turn my video off. And can you hear me okay? Yes, it sounds much better now. I'll let okay, you know if terrific. it starts going weird again. <laughs> so let me get back to my presentation. Okay, there we go. So the presentation I'm going to give today is Perfluoro, what CFAS and persistent contaminants in our lake. Um, my role at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services is to help assess the risk of various contaminants, including PFAS and other ones in our water resources, soil, and wildlife. So for tonight's talk, I'm going to really focus on emerging contaminants in PFAS, but I'm also happy to answer questions about other persistent chemicals, heavy metals, or other things that might be found in our lake system. So what are emerging contaminants? This is a term that is often used by researchers to describe chemicals that we don't really have a great amount of information to know what their risk might be, or maybe we have a limited ability to detect these chemicals in the environment. So this can include things like PFAS chemicals that we're going to talk about, but it can also include contaminants like microplastics, where we're developing the ability to measure microplastics in the environment, but we're still uncertain about what their risks are and what they may be doing to our health or the health of wildlife. This can also include personal care products and pharmaceuticals. So if we think of a lot of drugs that get flushed down the drain when we go to the bathroom, various antibiotics that are used by humans, but also in livestock and various pets, and even things like UV filters. So when we think of nanoparticle titanium dioxide or various UV filters that are in sunblock, we know that a lot of these can become mobile in the environment after people get in the water. And we're beginning to learn what these might do to human and animal health. But I also like to give a call out to what we call re-emerging contaminants. So these are contaminants like PCBs, lead, heavy metals, or even algae blooms, nitrates, and fertilizer runoff. These are things that we've struggled with for decades now to manage in freshwater systems, but they're starting to re-emerge as new issues as we sort of develop in various parts of the country. Now, tonight we're going to talk about PFAS, and that's an acronym that we use a lot in my field. A lot of people will see this acronym in news headlines, but the question is what the F fluorine is PFAS. PFAS is a term used for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So this is a family of over 4,000 compounds. They used to be called perfluorochemicals, but as we do in science, we didn't like one acronym, so we made more acronyms, and now we call them PFAS. Um, that estimate has increased to over 10,000 compounds. It really depends on how you define what is and isn't a chemical in this family. So there is no legal definition of what a PFAS is. This is a challenge for regulation and for policymakers alike for how we address these. But if we were to go through and think about the structure of these chemicals, you can start to understand why there's over four to 10,000 of these compounds. And it really comes down to having chemical structures where you have carbon with a lot of fluorine present. So one example of these is perfluorocarboxylic acids. So that's the structures that are shown here. And what you see on the zigzag carbon skeleton is a bunch of S, and that represents fluorine. So when you fluorinate a bunch of carbons like this, you get a PFAS molecule. Now, what's really neat about this is it takes a lot of energy to make a carbon fluorine bond. It takes a huge amount of energy to break it. So that means when you make that carbon fluorine bond, that fluorine is going to stay put for a really long time. It also means it's going to make this chemical structure really durable and resistant to a lot of things. So resistant to high heat, it's going to be resistant to Staining is going to be resistant to oil. It's going to be resistant to chemical reactions that could degrade this compound. So what's terrific about this is all you have to do is modify the M structure. So in the case over here, we have carboxylic acids because that little O and OH is a carboxylic acid. You swap out that end or that, if you want to call it the head portion of this, 
then you have a different class of PFAS compounds. These are perfluorosulfonic acids. It changes their properties a little bit. And we can use these in a lot of commercial products, a lot of industrial processes. And they're really valued for their durability and their capacity to resist degradation over time. And also their ability to act like surfactants. So if you imagine a really strong soap material that you can use for a lot of different purposes, we've used this for decades now. Now there are also other PFAS where we tweak the structures a little bit, we get new things. So if you kind of use your imagination and you start switching out any of these little lines for another squiggle, and as long as you have a bunch of S on there, you can start imagining where we get this family of over four to over 10,000 different chemicals. Now, in the United States, there's probably less than a couple of hundred that are actually being manufactured and used in the United States. Some of these have been phased out over a few years, and they are no longer made in the U.S., but they are made internationally in countries like China and India, and then imported into the U.S. Now, how are PFAS used in society? So, oftentimes, headline articles will call PFAS the Teflon toxin, and Teflon is a polymer. It has a lot of fluorine in it, but it's not technically a PFAS, depending on your definition. But we do use PFAS, like PFOA, which is a very specific member of the PFAS family, when we used to apply Teflon to pans. So if you think of nonstick pans, nonstick surfaces, right? These are things that even though you're cooking eggs or you're cooking meat in them, there's not going to form some chemical bond to the meat or to the surface, it's a nonstick surface. Now, to get Teflon to go on smoothly, you have to use PFAS. So we used to use PFOA. There's now a new product called Gen X that is, is still a PFAS, but we use it for this purpose. So a lot of nonstick cookware or nonstick other things we might use in our kitchens or even in our garage shops, other industrial applications, use PFAS. Another example over here is a picture of my husband in his waterproof winter jacket because he can't stand the cold to save his life. But if you think of Scotch Guard materials or Gore-Tex materials, these contain PFAS or PFAS is used in their manufacture. So oftentimes these articles of clothing have certain amounts of PFAS on them depending on what process is used and people may have exposure that way or when you throw away those coats and jackets and snow pants, or when you throw away a partially used can of ski wax, which also contains PFAS, when this ends up in landfills, the fabric and the clothing will degrade, but the PFAS that was there will not. And eventually it will can mobilize into the environment if it's not managed correctly. Now, here's a really long list of different industrial applications, but also commercial products that PFAS are used in. This is not an exhaustive list. There are other ways that we use PFAS. We're learning more and more about other sources. Um, a recent example that I learned about is if any of you have ever gone scuba diving or skiing and you use a defogging spray for your goggles to keep them from fogging up on you, that is actually PFAS because it's making the surface water repellent. Um, so there's a lot of uses in metal plating. There's a special type of firefighting foam that I'm gonna talk about shortly. But we also use in a lot of like electronics. So that way microchips and other things won't get wet. They won't develop staining. Um, for anyone that is scrolling through their phone right now as they're listening to this, if you've ever wondered why your smartphone screen doesn't build up a lot of grime and gunk on it, that's because we use PFAS coatings on that. But there's also a lot of commercial products. So PFAS are in your home. They may be in paints that you use on your walls, they may be used in paints that are used outside. Um, my own personal history was probably being exposed to PFAS when I was a child and eating popcorn like it was my job. So in New Hampshire, one of the main ways that we had PFAS exposure or PFAS release into the environment was the use of aqueous film forming foam or AFFF at the former Pease National Guard base. So the way that this foam works, and this is not all firefighting foams, it's a special class of firefighting foam, but let's say you have a plane that's landing, it's on fire, and you do not want the jet fuel to ignite and basically create a big bomb. You can spray this PFAS foam, which is just concentrated PFAS, because like I mentioned before, it's a surfactant. It'll foam up like dish soap. 
you can spray this and it'll separate the fuel from oxygen and basically suffocate the fire. Very quick acting, and that is really beneficial when trying to save lives in the case of the fire. But for the decades that it's been used at various airstrips around the world, eventually it's worked its way into groundwater supplies and contaminated drinking water sources. This was discovered in 2014 when drinking water was tested out at the Pease former National Guard base which is now a developed business park. And there's also a daycare there. And it was found that children at this daycare were drinking water with elevated amounts of PFAS. And a lot of the individuals that were out there now have elevated concentrations of PFAS in their bodies as a result of this exposure. Additionally, in Southern New Hampshire, we have some instances of industrial facilities that use PFAS to basically facilitate coating of various fabrics and other materials with nonstick processes. And those result in air emissions that have contaminated groundwater supplies in southern New Hampshire. So again, we're learning more and more about these different sources, but these are really the two big instances that triggered action in New Hampshire and for us to start investigating where else are these chemicals. So when we look at a map of groundwater supply, which is what this map is showing, I realize it looks like a box of children's cereal exploded on a map, and I apologize for that. But basically, if you're looking at green, you're seeing groundwater wells that we tested that are meet or are below the state's current standard for safe drinking water. Whereas if you see spots that are purple, red, or orange, that is where groundwater exceeds what we have deemed to be safe for a long-term exposure. So I realize I'm talking to a lakes group and you're very interested in surface water, but I'm showing you this groundwater map to make the point that We've been testing around the state and we've realized there are certain areas that are hot spots for these when we look in groundwater. And that's one of the reasons that we have started investigating some of those same areas to see what's going on in surface water, fish, and other media. Now, this graph here is showing you blood concentrations of PFAS when we look at average New Hampshire residents. So the New Hampshire Division of Public Health Services recently completed a chemical exposure study of residents from across the state. And when we look at this handful of PFAS across the bottom, we see that some of these are elevated or that we had detection. And for a fair number of these, you know, it's, some of them are similar to what we see around the US. So they're comparable to people that live in other parts of the country. But when we look in areas where there's contamination groundwater or areas in certain parts of the seacoast, we see that people have higher than average concentrations or higher than what we would expect to see of these chemicals. Now, something to bear in mind though, is everyone on earth essentially, almost 95% of the global population has some detectable level of these chemicals. We have been using them since the 1950s. They take centuries to de or decades to centuries to break down the environment. So since they don't break down, they move around and they eventually ended up in people and therefore we're finding them in everyone. Now other states have begun testing for these. So this is a map showing of public water systems that have started to test for these chemicals. This is a map put together by the Environmental Working Group. New Hampshire has a lot of dots on this map because we have a drinking water standard. So we require public water systems to test for these. Maine has not passed an official regulatory value for their drinking water, so they have limited public water system testing. Similarly with New York, they've only recently passed a drinking water standard, so they've not done as much comprehensive testing as we have done or as Massachusetts has done. But what this map is showing, right, is we are testing for this. This is something that's gaining the attention of various regulatory agencies. So as I mentioned before, PFAS originate from industrial processes and then they go out in consumer products that can result in human exposure or they become a burden to our waste infrastructure. This includes landfills, wastewater treatment facilities and other sites. And eventually these can end up in the environment. So it's a little bit more complicated this when we start looking at individual PFAS or individual products. But ultimately what I'm concerned about as a toxic ecologist is what's the human exposure? Because if you are exposed to these chemicals, that's when I begin to ask the question of, is there health risk to you or to your family? 
Now, the primary way that we're exposed to PFAS is through ingestion. So either contaminated drinking water or contaminated food. And that includes possibly contaminated fish, which I'll talk about later. But certain PFAS have been shown to transfer pretty easily across the human placenta and through breast milk. So if you were born after the 70s, you most likely have these chemicals already in your body at birth. Um, inhaling these doesn't seem to be as major a route of exposure, but if you're inhaling dust, so as I mentioned, we use a lot of commercial products in our homes, various carpets, nonstick fabrics on furniture. As those wear down and generate dust, that may be a source of exposure as you inhale that and that drains into either your stomach or into your lungs. They're less easily absorbed across the skin, so usually we're not worried about recreational swimming contact or things like showering or bathing. But certain PFAS are bioaccumulative which means at very small levels in the environment, they can build up in your body over time and become a problem. Now, when we look at the health effects associated with PFAS, we've found that there is a potential for increased cholesterol levels, various changes in liver enzyme levels that may be indicative of liver stress and toxicity, some changes in infant birth weight to alterations in the immune function, and there may be a risk for preeclampsia in pregnant women and maybe changes in thyroid hormones. A few studies have pointed to some increased risk for kidney or testicular cancer, which has raised concern amongst environmental risk assessors and toxicologists, but this is something that's still being investigated. There are a lot of studies going on right now. So one of my roles at the state agency is to track these new studies as they come out. Um, every week there's a new study coming out on PFAS and looking at different groups around the world to see what these do to people. My job is to help keep up with that information, help inform our agency so we can make recommendations to protect human health. There is a study going on actually of residents from around the Pease Air Force Base and people that had worked there and had exposure. If anybody wants more information about that, you can follow the link here or just give me a call. I'm happy to talk through it and figure out exactly what it is you want to learn about. Now, what's the PFAS profile in certain links? We know that PFAS can bioaccumulate into fish and other aquatic organisms. Research from around the world has shown us that. We know that it's because of a complicated and poorly understood interaction between water, sediment, and whatever the prey is that fish are feeding on. And anything that's consuming those fish likely has an exposure to PFAS. So what the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services did was in 2020, going into 2021, we decided to conduct a study of some lakes to see what is out there. You know, up to this date, we haven't really done any sampling for PFAS and fish, and we wanted to see what was going on. So we looked at primarily 14 lakes. We had two lakes, Armington and Highland Lake, that were in the northern areas where we did not expect as much PFAS contamination to be present. And then we also looked at another 12 lakes in the southern portion of the state where we know because of various industrial processes, other potential sources of PFAS, and the dense population down there is very likely that we would find PFAS in these water bodies. So in order to sample this, we tested the water at three different depths, so the upper, middle, and deep layer, because we suspect that PFAS may be separating into different parts of the water column based on their properties. We also grabbed a sample of the sediment, so we could see is there a relationship between what's in the sediment and what's in the fish, or what's in the sediment and what's in the surface water. And then finally, we collected samples of two fish species from each lake. Now, ideally, we'd like to get the exact same two species at all lakes to make even comparisons across the board. But for any of you that have gone out and spent all day on a lake and tried to catch the exact same two species of fish of the exact same size, it doesn't work that way. So when we look at some of this data later on, I'm going to primarily focus on the data that we had from bass from each lake, either largemouth or smallmouth. But we do have some data on some other fish species that I can touch on. Now, when we look at these samples, um, we are looking at PFAS. We sent it off to a specialty lab because the state lab currently does not have the capacity or capability to analyze for PFAS in fish tissue, water, or in sediment. So this is something that we had to contract out for. So when we look at the water results, this colorful graph here is showing you several different types of PFAS that were detected in these different lakes. 
So one of the things you might notice immediately is Armington Lake and Highland Lake, we had no detectable levels of PFAS in the surface water. But when we looked at these other 12 lakes in the southern portion of the state, we did find various detectable levels of different PFAS. For the most part, profiles varied between these and the predominant compounds were PFOA in bright red, along with PFOS was detected in all the lakes. So that's that bright blue color. Now, each of these acronyms does stand for different PFAS, and it's not as important of which acronyms are up there, but what's the driving thing here is sort of the variety that we see, and that we're detecting these in parts per trillion concentration. So again, that's parts per trillion or nanograms per liter. And in total, we're not really over 100 parts per trillion, but we're seeing a sort of mixture across these. When we looked at sediments, there was only one compound, PFOSA and PFBS, that were barely detected in the sediment. Now, some of that may be due to the ability to detect PFAS in sediments is not as refined as what we can do for PFAS in water. But also some of the research that we've looked at suggests that there may be an effect of the type of sediments that we have here. and They may not be as effective at absorbing PFAS as other sediments in other lakes around the world. It's still something we have to do some more investigation on. And again, there's a question of analytical capability. So looking at this, this is in parts per trillion. And we saw that you know, two northern lakes don't seem to have them present. And then we have PFAS in some of the other southern lakes. But when we turn our attention to bass, so this is either largemouth bass or smallmouth bass from the various lakes, all lakes had detectable levels of some combination of PFAS, especially PFOS. So PFOS is a PFAS compound that has been phased out of production in the United States, but because of its persistence, it will linger in the environment for a while. So this bright blue bar shows you that you know, the predominant amount of PFAS that we found in each of these fish was the PFOS compound. And this is consistent with research of fish from around the world where this compound seems to be especially bioaccumulative in fish. So parts per trillion in the environment become parts per billion in their fillets. Now, there were some other samples taken of perch and sunfish. Um, the link here will take you to those full results, but they're pretty consistent with what we were seeing here for the bass. What is interesting though, is we didn't really see any rhyme or reason behind you know, where a species sat on the food web. So either predators or non-predator, or sort of lower predator fish as having more PFAS. And again, we don't really understand how the bioaccumulation and biomagnification is occurring in these chemicals. So there may be something we're not accounting for that could explain why we see more in one water body than we do in others. Now, my question as a toxicologist is, where do I make recommendations from people to limit their consumption? So this is a really busy graph, but what it's showing is the different PFOS concentrations from fish across the different lakes. Now, across all of New Hampshire, we already have a recommendation that the typical fisher person does not consume more than four meals per month of wild caught fish in New Hampshire because of methylmercury that's present. Uh, methylmercury is both naturally occurring, but it's also released by combustion of coal, burning of wood, a lot of other industrial sources, and some of that drifts all the way over from across the Midwestern United States and settles up here. So we know that mercury is an issue, and we already tell people to restrict their consumption because of mercury, but we wanted to know which water bodies had an issue where PFOS was so problematic that it required more caution than what we already caution people related to mercury. So this is sort of a graphical way that we look at that. But another way to think about it is this. Statewide, we tell the typical adult four meals per month because of mercury. And for women of childbearing age or children younger than seven, one meal per month or less. But when we looked at these five lakes, we found that in some cases, the bass species, or in some cases, all species, merited restricting that a little bit further to protect health. So these consumption advisories are just guidance for residents. You know, we're not going to come out and slap handcuffs on someone because you had five meals per month. Hmm. But if you're concerned about your health or trying to protect against the effects of some of these chemicals, we strongly recommend that you follow this guidance. 
Um, only in one situation down in Hudson did we find a pond where for women of childbearing age or children younger than seven, where we'd recommend that they do not eat the fish because of how much PFOS is present. So a few words of caution though about this is, you know, one, the fish sampling effort that we did was a limited sample size and we also had to composite fish tissue. So instead of taking the average across five different baths, we had to basically blend the fish together so we could analyze one sample. And that's related to cost. Analyzing one fish sample for PFAS costs between $500 to $700, depending which lab you go to. It can be quite expensive. And for looking at the number of lakes we were trying to get, we had to limit that. Also, the sampling was biased to South Central New Hampshire and is not entirely representative of all the lakes in New Hampshire. So yes, PFAS are likely present in many of our lakes. Yes, if we sampled fish from all the lakes, we will probably detect some level of PFAS, but not all lakes will likely require a consumption advisory. However, the challenge is we don't know until we test. And that is one of the challenges with PFAS is we are trying to test where we can, when we can. Another issue is that the total risk of all PFAS is unknown. We know that people are not only being exposed to PFOS, they're being exposed to other PFAS compounds. And our knowledge about that risk is constantly evolving. And that's something that we are trying to understand so that we can make recommendations to protect people's health. But on that sort of mixtures issue, we also try to remind people that the state does have fish consumption advisories for other contaminants like mercury, cadmium, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which we know are carcinogens. So there are other contaminants present. We always encourage people to check our advisories at water bodies so that way they can know if it's better to just catch and release at a lake or if it's a lake where it's safe to eat. And finally, when I look at risk as a toxicologist, I am only looking at risk and trying to be as protective as I can be. It's hard for us to weigh that out though on the benefits of fish consumption. We know fish consumption is good for health. We know it's good for pregnant women, but we wanna caution against contaminants that may also be harmful. So some of this does come down to personal choice. For people that want to get more information about the risk so they can weigh the risk on the benefits, I'm always happy to have a conversation or there's also amazing researchers at universities around the state that would be happy to help out with that. So looking to the future, the way that we look at risk for PFAS is likely to change with new research. This is a constantly evolving area. And right now the EPA is starting to take a lot of action on PFAS and drinking water. And we suspect that they'll be turning their attention to fish and surface waters pretty soon. These contaminants are not alone. So again, you know, for recreational fishers, or if you are managing a lake system or trying to help people at a lake system, you know, remind them, check the advisories. Or if you want information to know if there are advisories at your lake, contact me. I will do the legwork to track that information down for you and answer any questions that I can. More based on applied research is needed to understand the risk of these chemicals. And that includes things like swimming and wading. You know, right now, we understand these to not be really a huge problem for skin contact but we want to keep trying to understand that. We're also partnering with Dartmouth College right now to do some research on shellfish and fish in the Great Bay system. And it'd be great if we can hopefully get support and funding down the road so we can do more research in New Hampshire's lakes to understand what the PFAS profile looks like. And that's where local partnerships are helping. So anytime we have an opportunity to partner with the Lake Association or groups that think that they may have an issue, if we can work together to find funding to do this work, we're always looking for that kind of support. And finally, risk communication is really important. And that's why I'm here tonight, because this is an issue. It's something we want people to be aware of. I want to engage with all of you as a community, but I also don't want everyone to be paralyzed with fear by thinking there's too much to do or too much to handle with this, because there are actionable things that we can do to either reduce our use of PFAS or just protect our health and be careful with fish consumption. So with that, I just want to acknowledge that I have a lot of support and help from other staff within the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. This includes the surface water programs and as well as staff in the Division of Public Health Services at the Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, a federal partnership program we have with the CDC through its Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry.
So with that, I think we can open it up for questions and uh, there's my contact information. Great, thank you so much. That's a lot of information to digest. Um, and let me just check the chat box here. And I'm also, because we do have a small group, I'll go ahead and um, allow everyone to um, unmute if they just wanna go ahead and start a conversation. So let me see if I can find the setting to do that quickly. Okay, so you should all now um, have the ability to unmute if you would like. Um, but let me go ahead and take a look here. Chris Berry said, in watersheds with development along riparian corridors, this is a big problem. Um, so that's more of a comment, but yes, I think you, you, um, your graphs were showing that um, that certainly seems to be the case. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so there really is this issue of most likely where we have the most human activity and development, we will have PFAS just by virtue of how many different products, construction products, other things that we use PFAS in, but also just where you have more people, as I mentioned, everyone has some level of exposure to PFAS. So even if we snapped our fingers today and made all PFAS products on the market disappear and somehow just shot them into space, every one of us is still slowly excreting PFAS from our body and our urine and our feces, and that's going into our waste infrastructure, and we still have to deal with that. And that is one of the issues where, you know, impacts through surface water discharges, impacts of waste application, certain uses. These are all potential sources, but it's not going away overnight. And just where we have that development, because we've been using these since as early as the 60s, possibly the early 50s, a lot of areas are still gonna have these contaminants present. Yeah. Um, we do have another comment in here. I noticed high PFAS level near Lake Wakiwan. Let's see, um, slide, let me see. Let's go back to slide. Was it nine, he said? Yeah, what is on slide P9? P9, P9. There, getting there? Not sure exactly yeah, which slide it was. So was it possibly this one or? Was it a there we map go. like this yeah. or was it a graph? It was this map near okay. Southern Lake Wakion. Okay, so uh, you're gonna have to help me out and tell me where that lake is because I am not familiar with all of our lakes locations. I should have brushed up on that and memorized them before this call, but I am not familiar with where every lake is. Sure, this is Tom. It's northwest of Winnipesaukee's northwest okay. point. Okay, so tell me if I'm getting hotter or colder. Yep, go south. South? East, east. There you go, east. There you go. Coming to it now. Okay. Yeah, so some of these may, and I think in that area, some of that is for groundwater. So the yellow and red dots there, I believe, are for either groundwater or public water systems. They may also be for private wells in that area that test is high for these chemicals. Um, I know around like Squam Lake and like Winnesquam, there are some areas that the state has been investigating and it may be related to either some former waste practices there or in some of these cases, it's related to the use of that firefighting foam I talked about. Um, that's that firefighting phone was not only used at airports. Um, several of our local fire departments had to keep this on hand because if you have an oil tanker rollover, this is the firefighting phone you use to put that out. And if you think about how many New Hampshire homes still burn oil because we have those delivery routes through here, 
a lot of communities still keep that firefighting foam on hand. But some of those firefighting stations have either contributed to groundwater contamination or at previous sites where maybe an oil tanker rollover happened and they discharged this foam. Historically, there wasn't really much cleanup effort done because these were portrayed by the manufacturers as being inert and environmentally safe. Uh, we now know that that is not true. But again, several of these dots on here are reflecting, or actually most of these dots on here are reflecting groundwater. So um, if you want to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to track down what the exact sources of those are and see if we have any information on that lake. Um, but at this time, I don't think we have surface water data on that lake. So for surface water, we only have a handful of data points from across the state. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Um, Chris Berry says, with limitations on federal regulatory jurisdiction imposed by the SCOTUS, will New Hampshire take up more rigorous regulatory posture in order to protect its unique water resources? So that gets, into, that gets in a tricky area for me because as a toxicologist, I don't know what the Attorney General is going to determine one way or another on issues related to SCOTUS decisions. Um, I do know that one of the things that our surface water division is looking at is if there are certain water bodies that are used as sources of drinking water, we're looking at the option of seeing if we can use our drinking water standards as regulations for those water bodies. Um, however, in New Hampshire, we sort of have specific rules of when and how we can do that, where we can apply a drinking water standard to surface water, because those drinking water standards are meant to protect surface water for the use of drinking. We typically tell people do not drink lake water, um, but there are some public water systems that draw and treat surface water as a source of water for their community. So we are looking at that option. One of the other things that we did do was in the beginning of 2020, I believe it was January 1st, 2020, we did send a report over to the legislature to let them know what the cost timeline and data needs would be if New Hampshire DES was to be directed to produce surface water standards. So that was one of the things that my position helped out with along with scientists from our surface water bureau because their legislature realized that, okay, if we set a drinking water standard, which they authorized and supported DES in developing that, if we go that route, well, we also need to look at surface water. And we sent that report over, but it's been difficult to sort of get traction behind that because the EPA is supposed to be working on setting a surface water standard. They have talked about putting that out there. They actually released a draft of that this year for public comment. Um, I think the public comment window closes next week. So that's something that we're reviewing to see if it's possible. Um, but I think getting back to the heart of your question, there is that concern of, you know, what does the SCOTUS decision mean for federal agencies? And then how does that trickle down to states and what either we can or can't do? So. I don't mean to necessarily not fully answer the question, but some of it is we don't know at this time. Again, you know, if we were to set a surface water standard, one of the big hurdles for that is the lab capability to actually test for these. Right now, there's only a handful of labs in the country that can actually do this analysis. And as I mentioned before, it's in the hundreds of dollars. And we have brought up the idea in the past of having the state receive funding so that way we could set up an internal lab for doing this analysis. But one of the challenges of looking for PFAS is you have to have a dedicated lab space and dedicated equipment to look for PFAS because actually the tubing and parts that we use in analytical chemistry machines are coated in PFAS. So that way they don't react with the chemicals that you're looking for in other cases. So you can't use any of that equipment or gear to measure for PFAS because otherwise you're just measuring what's in the machine. So there's sort of a technical hurdle along with that sort of jurisdiction and authority question that not only New Hampshire, but a lot of other states are grappling with. Tricky. <laughs> okay. Um... 
so we have rep Representative Tom Pelosi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, Tom. Sorry. Feel free to um, chime in here. Close enough. Pelosi. <laughs> Pelosi. Okay. Yes, you mentioned that that um, that the bill did just pass, and I'm sure if Michelle was here this evening. She's our advocacy program manager. She could have plenty to say about this um, that addresses landfills near high water levels. And certainly feel free, Tom, if you have anything you want to add about that. I'm going to stay out of the politics of it, but it's on the governor's desk and he had a decision to veto it. I, I have not checked if he has. Yeah, I would imagine um, landfills would certainly make a difference um, if they're right next to a water source for this particular topic, among many other things. Um, and then Chris did follow up with what you had been talking about earlier, Jonathan. He said, fair enough. Understandably, the science and policy making may not be as well aligned as we'd like. Great presentation. So thank you for that. Okay, um, we do have some time left. So if anybody has anything else they'd like to add, certainly go ahead and do that while we are still chatting. Otherwise we might end up um, closing down a little bit early. Um, and I'm sorry if I, I missed this while you were talking, Jonathan, but so if a private homeowner who has a well wants to get tested, to test for this particular, you know, for PFAS, it's hundreds of dollars, and then what, we'd have to mail it out of state because there's nothing in state? Correct. There are some labs in state that will take a sample for you, but almost all the labs are contracting out with someone out of state. Um, more labs are starting to develop the capacity and capability to do PFAS analysis. Um, but the trick is they're all focusing right now on the ability to test in drinking water. And one of the tricky things with PFAS is if we go back and think about that chemical structure that they had, their chemical structure is actually very similar to a lot of natural compounds. If you just swapped out all the fluorines for hydrogen. So we actually run into this problem where when we look at things like surface water or sediment sometimes, or even fish tissue, if we look at the wrong species, we can actually get false positives. Mm -hmm. We get false signals for PFAS. Um, a great example of this was actually back in 2019, the Air Force out at Pease sampled a lot of shellfish, so clams, mussels, bivalves for PFAS. And they had pretty low levels of all the PFAS they looked for, except for one. There was one PFAS, um, it's called perfluoropentanoic acid. So it's five carbon penta and it was in all the shellfish and it was at really high levels, like really, really high levels that made no sense. No one could figure out why they would be this high because no other study ever found these chemicals, that specific chemical at those concentrations in shellfish. So it wasn't making sense. And when it, the samples were sent to a different lab, they couldn't detect it at all. It wasn't present. So we actually worked with the EPA's Office of Research and Development, and they've identified that there is a natural fatty acid produced by invertebrate shellfish that tricks the analytical chemistry machine into thinking that this PFAS is present when in fact it's actually this natural fatty acid. Now, the way they were able to detect that difference is because the EPA Office of Research and Development basically has the Lamborghini of analytical equipment, whereas a lot of commercial labs are using standard equipment and they just run their machine or they run their data through an automatic algorithm and they don't check it by hand, whereas the EPA, they're going through and they're checking each result individually. It's very time intensive, but they were able to figure that out. And we actually run into this issue with a lot of other samples, um, they used to run into this with chicken eggs, where they would think chicken eggs had extremely high levels of PFOS in them, but then we realized there is a natural fatty acid in chicken eggs that can cause a false signal. So getting back to the issue of testing, right, when we look at surface water, there's all kinds of stuff in lake surface water that can give us a false signal. So we need special labs or we need highly trained chemists 
look at that data, do the analysis, and make sure that what we are seeing in the results is really there. Mm -hmm. We figured that out for drinking water, and groundwater is pretty similar to drinking water, so we're very confident in those results, and a lot of labs are focusing on that right now. But it's still kind of the Wild West when it comes down to looking at samples in other environmental media. And that's been a real challenge with PFAS. And you know, again, we're mostly contracting out for that. Now, small group, but feel free to share this information with whoever. We do have a state program that is testing private wells. So depending on your location, we are prioritizing certain areas and we're testing until the money runs out. But we are doing a lot of testing of private wells. So if you're more or less in the southern New Hampshire area, there are some parts in the middle of the state that are near sites that we're investigating. But we do have a website. So if you go to NHDESB Fast Investigation, that link right there, there is a drop down tab for seeing if you're eligible for testing or to get your private well tested. And the state will pay to test your private well for PFAS. Um, that's usually between $300 to $500, depending which lab you go to. But the state is doing it for free in certain areas because we're trying to document and figure out what is the scope of this problem in private water wells. You know, in New Hampshire, a little under half of our residents are on private wells. So that's a lot of people that could be drinking unregulated water, whereas we know it's in the public water systems because we have a drinking water standard. They are legally obligated to test and report that data to us, but private well users are not. So that's something where if you're on a private well, unfortunately it is your responsibility to know it's in the well, but the state is offering help with that burden because you realize testing for PFAS isn't easy or cheap. That's interesting. Um, I noticed that there was a big red dot right next to where I live and I know that there was a big landfill on just the next road over some years ago that there was a big cleanup that was done because it was making people sick. So I'm interested in knowing if I could get my well tested. I'll have to check yeah. that out. Okay, let me see if there's any more questions. And Kat, feel free to chime in too if I've missed anything. I sometimes skip over stuff, on, not on purpose. Um, no. Okay. Just, uh, there was the mention of the bill. It got vetoed a couple weeks ago. And it looks like Tom just said in September there may be a veto override vote. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. We didn't know about that. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's on the list. I have not seen it yet. But uh, I think there's enough of us in there that will ask for it to try to override. I don't think there's enough votes to carry two thirds. Okay, well, I don't see anybody else um, typing any questions, um, but I just wanna thank you so much for joining us. This is fascinating information um, and I look forward to seeing what else you guys continue to work on over there at DES on this topic. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Absolutely, thank you for having me and thank you all for your questions. Oh, and just a reminder, this will be up on our website um, and on our YouTube channel. So if you wanna go back and revisit any of the conversations we had or any of Jonathan's great slides, you can certainly do that. And I'll just wish everybody a good evening and hopefully you can go out and enjoy the sunset before it gets too late. Perfect, thank you. Bye. Good night.